Hi, and welcome to Conversations with B'nai B'rith International. I'm CEO Dan Mary Ash. Thank you for spending some time with us today. If you enjoy our conversation series, make sure you never miss an interview by subscribing to the B'nai B'rith YouTube channel and liking us on Facebook. And be sure to visit our website, b'naibrith.org, to learn more about our work across the globe. Well, nearly a million and a half Jews fought as part of the Allied forces during the Second World War, including 550,000 Jewish men and women from the United States, 500,000 from the Soviet Union, and thousands more from other nations, numbers much higher than their relative percentage in the countries that they came from. So why has their heroism and their service gone unnoticed? That question is what the new Chaim Herzog Museum of the Jewish Soldier in World War II in Israel intends to explore. The museum will share stories of heroism alongside the Holocaust and shed light on an important but neglected chapter in the history of the Jewish people. As the museum develops its exhibitions and weaves a humanizing narrative about the contributions of Jewish soldiers in defeating the Nazis, and Abrith is collaborating with the museum to help bring more stories to light, calling for Jewish World War II veterans and their families of those who served to submit short summaries of their lives. The effort is being led by our former president, Chuck Kaufman, and we're truly proud to be a part of it. As we continue this initiative, we are grateful to have the museum's director, Brigadier General, retired Tzvi Kantor, join us now for a special conversation. And he and I will discuss the institution's long-awaited opening, the crucial role Jewish soldiers played in defeating the Nazis, as well as the establishment of the State of Israel, and the importance of recognizing and honoring their contributions. Tzvi, thank you so much for joining us. It's an honor to speak with you. Thank you, Dan. Actually, you're saying the whole story. Well, there's more to tell, and that's why you're here. So let's start with your perspective. Uh, what is the museum's mission, and why is it named after Chaim Herzog, the much-beloved former president of the State of Israel? Well, what you just mentioned, actually, the, the most of the people don't know about it. For us, the Second World War is the one world, Holocaust. And that's the way, unfortunately, that we educated ourselves. We are not going to harm this uh, issue, of course, but we would like to say or to tell the other side of the Jewish people, the side that people came and, 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 and did something against this aggressive Nazi. They volunteered, they joined, they fought, they did something to defeat this uh, beast. And uh, because of the events, because of the time, we didn't talk about it. And we educated ourselves as a miserable, as a victims, as a nothing but those who, who did something. And suddenly the, the state of Israel raised up. And uh, you ask yourself, okay, where you came, uh, where the knowledge to fight against the Arabs during the independence war came? Yes, we had uh, a good uh, underground, the Palmach, the Etzel, the Agana, the Lehi. But the knowledge how to, to operate army, and I mean battalions, brigade, tanks, artillery, air force, navy. You don't have it in, uh, in the underground. Someone brought it. And those people never mentioned in our history. And we know nothing about it. And we hope that through this uh, very unique museum that we are just uh, in, in the last steps to, to finish, in a room, we'll tell the story and tell the story very nicely, very clear to the young generation. It will be a different museum that we use in other places. And uh, people who 
people will learn the, this issue uh, much better than, uh, than what happened today. Why Chaim Herzog? Chaim Herzog uh, was the president, of, the sixth president of Israel, but in his background, he was uh, an officer, intelligence officer in the British Army, major. And uh, after the war, he of course came to Israel and joined the IDF and was one of the first intelligence officers in the IDF. Uh, actually, he he was the intelligence officer in the Battle of Latrun in 1948. Later on, the, the chief of the intelligence, uh, the military intelligence in Israel, and we found it very, very clear that after the, the request of the family uh, to call the museum after his name. Well, it's certainly uh, a great honor and certainly a well-deserved honor for a man who served his country in so many different ways, um, and uh, especially as president, as ambassador in the United Nations, a historian, an author uh, of, of books about Jewish history, and uh, it certainly is a, is a great honor and, and, and well-deserved. Um, how did you get involved in this project? How did you become the director of the museum, and do you have a, a personal connection, perhaps, to uh, to some of those who actually did serve uh, during uh, World War II? Actually, I have no connection to this uh, issue. Uh, at the beginning, when uh, one of the old veterans came to me and started telling me about the, the idea of uh, building a museum in Latoon, uh, I, I well, for me, it was a like the other, uh, the other men in, in my generation. For us, uh, the Second World War is, it is Holocaust and, and those veterans uh, fought for their own country and that's it. And from his story, uh, I learned that I know nothing actually about the Jewish people in the Second World War. I know nothing about those who left their family and came after four or five years of, of fighting and found that there, there, there is no family, there's nothing. And from story to story, I, I actually uh, strengths my uh, to believe that uh, our museum, our site, in the internet site, is like a memorial for those people, for the private family, the, the, the community and the state. And, <clears throat> and uh, suddenly uh, families call me again and again and say, well, you had uh, a father to the family, you had a, a, an uncle to the family, that we know nothing about him before. And for us, uh, they will, will be remain 24 years old and while they lost their life. Yes, they fought for their own country, but they fought also as a Jewish people. And that's, uh, as you mentioned before, the, the, the percentage of the volunteers from the Jewish community is much higher than uh, any other community wherever whether it is in Canada or South Africa or Australia, or the States or the Russian countries. And uh, we are talking about one million and a half, one million and a half Jewish people fall. It is unbelievable. Only from, as I told you before, uh, we are talking about the underground, but those who volunteers from Eretz Israel were much higher than uh, the number was much higher than those who, who participated in the in the underground. And again, nobody talked about it. No, I think this is a this is a very important point um, when I think about it because in the United States, the war broke out in uh, for us it was uh, December 7, 1941. So at that time uh, in the United States, there there were probably under uh, five million Jews. Uh, and to think that uh, 
almost a, a tenth or about a tenth of the Jewish population actually actually served, and so and so for the Soviet Union as well, where there were probably about five million Jews more or less, and it was the same the same uh, percentage. So this is a it's a great story, and of course the other countries that you mentioned, and it's a great story of service uh, and of of um, of participating in. Uh, this um, this effort of the Allies uh, to to defeat uh, the Nazis. Now I want to ask you uh, about the museum. It's being built in Latrun on the main road between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. Uh, why did you choose that location? In other country, this will be must be uh, a mission of the of the government, a mission of the of the people. In Israel, or in, uh, among the Jewish people, unfortunately, it was not came from the the, the headquarter of the of the of the people, let's say the government. It came from a private uh, initiative, as I told you. This old man who came to us, he was. Well, I said to us, we are the members of Yad Lashirion. Yad Lashirion is the the memorial site of the Armor Corps that made a, a site in Latun. And if you will come to Latun, you will find a. I say one of the biggest tank uh, museum in the world. And among our members, there were quite uh, a lot of veterans that say, "Listen, you have to tell the the stories about us." Even even the armor corps in Israel, actually, the the, the first tanks were operated by. Uh, English, by Russian, by Polish, by Yiddish, not by Hebrew, because no one from the volunteers in Eretz Israel operated tank before. All those tankists, uh, tank crew members, came from other countries. Uh, let's uh, tell their, so their own story. So the initiative came from us. At that time, the prime minister was Arik Sharon. Uh, yes, he was our commander during the Yom Kippur War, and uh, he, of course, uh, gave us uh, his blessing and uh, the decision of the government. But, and I'm talking about 2002, but the, the government between the prime minister and the, the authorization to, to start building took us more than 10 years. And now we are, uh, we are going to, to, to finish the, the project. And I well, I've seen, that... uh, I've, I've, I've been to the site, I've been to the museum, and it is quite impressive. I mean, even for those who would like to see the history of, um, of the Armored Corps. Uh, there is a, a tremendous array of uh, of tanks and, and armored vehicles, which really do tell the story in all of, of the wars um, of the important role uh, that the armored corps played. But the location, I would say, as a as a visitor, I mean, I think location is perfect because it does lie between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, and the the, the spot is a is a good one, and um, and it it really makes it makes good sense. So let me ask you. Um, how you know in this in the age where museums are very much uh, connected to new technologies? Um, how are you intending to to tell the story of the Jewish soldiers who fought in World War II? Thank you. Uh, as I told you before, it will be a real, a new, uh, and the most advanced uh, technology that we can deliver the story. Today, uh, uh, people don't read books. I'm talking about the young generation. Uh, but they watch, uh, they watch uh, movies. And the movie must be uh, not, not more than uh, two minutes. You know, TikTok and all the other uh, way of delivery the, the information. So we... We are working how to tell the, this story within a few minutes, very short, very sharp, in order that later, after you will go out from the museum, 
you will make a Google and, and, and continue the, the information about it. So uh, just to give you the some uh, uh, hint uh, to, to go into the, this subject and, and to continue and learn more and more about what they are going to, to, to watch in the museum. Uh, for the young generation, it will be a quite experience. What, what, are the, what are the lessons? It's very important about the young generation because, you know, for, for so many years, you know, there were people who asked, you know, why, why didn't we, you know, why didn't we fight? Why didn't we respond? And of course, the, you know, as years pass, more and more, we know about partisans. We know about Jewish rescuers. And, and now you're bringing the story of a million and a half uh, Jewish uh, men and women uh, who fought in, in the Allied effort to bring the Nazis down. Uh, so we have really, we've got the complete picture. Um, in addition to the million and a half, will you also uh, be including the partisans who, who fought so bravely in so many places, as well as Jewish rescuers? Absolutely, absolutely. For us, well, well uh, you know, in the Hebrew, we used to say lochem. We try to translate it to English. And each uh, word in English should give you a different meaning. But we are talking about fighters all over the, the rainbow, uh, which means uh, as a civilian in the underground, in the partisans, in, uh, in uniform, in uh, regular armies, in reserve armies, uh, wherever. Each one who took something and, and do something is a fighter, is a soldier. Soldier with a uniform or soldier without uniform. So the name in Hebrew is Lochem, but the name in English is soldier, but actually we, we mean to the all kind of soldiers, with or without uniform. How do you um, see diaspora Jews uh, being involved in the museum on an ongoing basis, not just as visitors, and we hope, of course, many people will come and, and visit. Um, because um, it is the younger generations um, who are going to keep these stories alive and, and, and perpetuate the, the memory. Um, so how do, you, how do you see we Jews who are living in the diaspora um, really connected to the museum? I, I would say that this is the, will be the, the first museum or any institute in Israel that say, well, the diaspora is part of us, part of the Jewish people. There is no Israel and the diaspora. We are saying that we are all uh, the, the Jewish people together. So, for example, someone in New Zealand or Australia or whatever, find the information about his uh, relative, write it, send it to us through the, the site, and and immediately he will get uh, what we call the page of warrior for each one of it, as a, as a personal, as a, as a family. To the community, you can say, okay, we are from, let's say, from Boston. We got uh, all the Jewish people from Boston who volunteer and or fought during the Second World War and give them a special place. Uh, and And... We are talking about loyalty, and uh, and we can say yes. The Jewish people can live a state and will be fully uh, loyal to the to the state of of the United States, and in the same time, fully uh, loyal to the Jewish people. And, and those two loyalties can go together. And that's why uh, I believe that each one of the Israelis who will come into this museum will go out and will be very proud of the Jewish people, as part of the Jewish people, and see that those who came from other countries, or the diaspora, as we call it, is part of us, or we are part of them. So the connection between Israel and the diaspora will be uh, uh, will be shown in this in this museum very well. 
Um, we've talked about gathering these testimonies um, and um, service records, uh, if you will, uh, to uh, have a collection and archive uh, of these records. But are you also looking for memorabilia? Are you looking for for uniforms or um, dog tags or um, uh, decorations and ribbons and so forth? Are, are, is that something which you are also going to archive? Yes, if this is a, if this is a, a something unique, yes, of course we got the, the uniform, the, the all the ribbons, all the other. But if you have a, a special story behind this uh, uh, things, please send it to us, and we will put it in the museum. There's um, there's been a lot of press in the U.S. and books actually about the the Ritchie boys who were the these uh, German uh, Austrian Jews who made their way uh, to the United States and then turned around and then went back into uh, service. I mean, here in the United States, I, I think Henry Kissinger served Ambassador Richard Schifter, who, uh, the late Ambassador Schifter, who chaired uh, the American Jewish Institute of Inter for International Relations, um, and uh, and so many others um, uh, wound up going back uh, into into service. Um, will there be any kind of special section or uh, any any um, exhibition, part of the exhibition devoted to the Ritchie boys? Absolutely. We have, uh, just to give you, uh, the museum will be uh, around six wings. An introduction, the, the second ring will be about the first years between 1939 to 1941, while Europe actually fought. Then the Russian wing, the American wing, among them the Ritchie boys saw a story. The other wing will be about the underground and the partisans. And the, the last wing will be the volunteers from LT Israel. So it really and covers all of, all of those who served. Absolutely. And the last show will be how the Jewish soldier become an, an Israeli soldier and their contribution to the idea of building the, the Israeli force. Let's talk about history uh, for a minute. Uh, we're now 77 years beyond 1945. Uh, <clears throat> survivors um, are, are passing from the scene. I think I read something. Um, last week that said just in 2021, 15,000 survivors had passed away. But in addition to survivors, uh, the veterans, uh, World War II veterans uh, are in the same age category um, and they're passing from the scene. Do you think that this distance of 77 years um, actually allows historians to get a fuller understanding of the war and on the Shoah, how do, you, how do you see the passage of time, which is so important here, as we move to a point where at some point there will be no more veterans and there will be no more survivors? So what do you think? Connecting to your question, please, if you know someone who is still clear and can tell us his own story, please go and record him and ask him, because his story for us is very important. I will give you, with your permission, one short uh, example. A few years ago, uh, or let's say before, the, the, the most uh, famous general in the American army was Morris Holtz. Actually, he was, the one, I think, the only uh, army general that the state had. The other Jewish people arrived to a major and come, that's it. And suddenly we found someone like Maurice Hall, if you had, he was the commander of the Third Armor Division. And when I asked my professional uh, Soviet people, uh, how come? And he said that they, they say, well, he actually hided his Judaism. Uh, he appeared like uh, other. And we have a movie of his uh, funeral, and he was buried as a regular soldier, not in a Jewish uh, funeral. 
And that's how we rebuilt it. He postponed his Judaism. And one day I got uh, an information about uh, an old veteran. They came to visit him. It was very hot. He sat in his uh, living room with his uh, t-shirt and I asked his uh, maid to give him something to worry because uh, we are going to record him. He was blind. Uh, couldn't see me, but he heard. His wife uh, passed away uh, a year before. His, uh, his uh, elder uh, son passed away five years before. His grandchild uh, passed away in the, what we call the helicopter disaster, in, if you heard about it, when we lost more than 70 soldiers. And suddenly I came to him and asked him about his history. And he started asking me, uh, well, I start asking him a uh, question. Meanwhile, the, the, the man who came with the camera uh, prepared, or well, he was not ready. And uh, this man started telling me his story, and he was, uh, he was born in uh, Berlin uh, after the, the Nacht, he made Aliyah uh, while the war started in 1939. He joined the British Army, went to the Pioneer Corps, uh, became a prisoner of war in the uh, Greek, all the disaster with the British Army when they left uh, more than 1,500 uh, Jewish uh, soldiers from Earth Israel in, in Greek. And they were sent as a prisoner of war to uh, Lambsdorff in uh, Germany. Today is uh, Poland. And this man, after three years, uh, as he told me, he became tired uh, to be a prisoner of war and find the uniform of the Hitler Jugend and, and start walking by foot from Lambsdorff, Krakow, Poland, to uh, Normandy because they are the American uh, landed in Europe. And after a couple of months uh, with broken legs, he was <coughs> captured by, uh, as he told me, two black guys that brought him to uh, their commander. And the commander was uh, uh, Major General Morris Rose. And how did he uh, investigate this uh, uh, man? In Yiddish. I say, what? Yiddish? How come? Because he is supposed to hide his uh, Judaism. And he said, no, 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 no. He was a real proud Jewish person. I said, oops. And, and meanwhile, the, the man with the camera was uh, ready. And, uh, and, uh, and I asked him to repeat his uh, story. And he repeated uh, very, it was very, he hardly talked at the time. And when we arrived to Morisot, I asked him to, to talk in front of the camera. And two weeks after, his son called me. His son is a professor in Adassa and Karem, a hospital in Jerusalem, and say, hey, my father passed away. So he came to the Shiva. And the second answer, or the, the second uh, question that he asked me, Zika, why did you ask my father twice about the uh, Maurice Rose? And did you ask him, didn't ask him about being EOW or whatever? And I told him, back to the, he said, I, I got some stories about the, 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 the POW camps or the life over there. But the only man in the world that changed the, the the situation of Maurice Rose from just different men to a very proud Jewish was that guy. And it by mistake. So I don't know what kind of information we can collect by those people all over the world that will go and, collect and 
and interview their own uh, relatives or friends or whatever. No, but I'll tell you, too, you know, the really, there are so many stories. We know that. It's just a matter of, of getting out and gathering this material. I'm pleased that our former president, uh, Chuck Kaufman, has uh, gone out to do this, uh, to bring in stories. And in my own family, for example, <clears throat> we uh, had a cousin passed away several years ago in his 90s. Uh, who was in the uh, the Soviet army, uh, fought in the Battle of Kursk, was uh, was decorated, um, ultimately came to Israel, was a well known mathematician, um, and and the story that his story has been carefully preserved by the family. Most of them are now in Israel, and I intend to make sure that you get uh, the information about my cousin Yasha Chvalas. Um, because th this is just one of, of, of thousands, and, and it's, uh, it's a great story. And every one of these stories is a little bit different. They may, some of them may have served in the same units. Some of them may have been in the same battles. But everybody really has, has their own story to tell. And in that, in that regard, in that context, let me ask you, does the museum expect to engage in research and publication? Uh, because you're going to gather this information. Uh, historians are going to, I'm sure, um, uh, you know, make themselves available to the museum to, to write about these issues. What do you envision in terms of research uh, and publication? Just a, uh, just a moment before, you mentioned uh, the Battle of Kursk. I, I'm not sure that all of our listeners will know what does it mean, uh, the, the Battle of Kursk. But in the Russian wing, we are going to make a huge diorama about the Battle of Kursk. They're the only one, in, you know, in the world that uh, actually we will present it. And I believe that visitor after the visit in the, in the museum will understand what what did, what did you mean when you say the Battle of Kursk? Uh, about the research, we are going to build a, a very uh, big uh, archive and, and uh, information center that will collect and collect the all the researchers, uh, students, uh, whatever, to come and, uh, and get uh, the information. We got a lot of uh, interviews with those uh, veterans, not enough, but uh, a lot of uh, material that you can make a lot of uh, researchers about this subject that may say something not uh, nicely so much, you know, in every university in Israel, you got a, a kativa about the, the Holocaust. None of them got even one lesson about the, the, the heroism, about the fighters. So by this museum, actually, we would like to, to change the situation and give a lot of options to those young researchers to, to, to develop this uh, subject. So the big question is, uh, when uh, do you expect the museum uh, to open? Uh, when I visited with our former president, uh, Kaufman, uh, last summer, uh, the museum was still kind of working its way through. And we could see where these rooms and the six different exhibitions would, would be held. What do, you, uh, what do you see as a possible uh, opening date? The opening date will be around uh, June. Exactly the time we let uh, the leaders of those countries, and I believe that the Alta meeting will be held in Latun 2022, because we invited uh, President Biden, we invited the, the Prime Minister Johnson, and we invited the President Putin. And let's hope that three of them will uh, repeat uh, the famous story from Yalta in Latun 2022. Now, famous picture. Uh, yeah. What What are you looking for? The last question. What are you looking forward to once the museum opens to the public? How would How would you like to see it received? Uh, first of all, I hope that every student in Israel will visit our museum. I hope that every soldier will visit our our museum. Uh, and it will be part of the of the education system in Israel. Uh, it will be 
you, you talk about the location. It is a beautiful uh, uh, space uh, to come and uh, to make events, uh, not only around this uh, the Jewish people, but uh, the Jewish soldier, but uh, any other events that would be over, over there, and it will, it will, it will be a real uh, one of the centers uh, of in Israel. When you say I, I will be in the museum in Latrun, people will know about it. Well, it's going to tell a, a fantastic story, a story of courage, of resilience. <clears throat> the Jewish population in the world uh, in 1939 uh, was, uh, uh, was small relative to as it is today. And of course, it's, our proportion today is much smaller because of what happened during the Shoah. Nevertheless, uh, the, the fact that um, these men and women rose to the occasion, fought uh, with, with great um, uh, bravery uh, uh, to defeat the Nazis um, as part of the Allied effort is a terrific story. And we're so pleased uh, that there is going to be a place uh, in Israel uh, where they can learn, everyone can learn more about it. So check out JWMWW2. Dot org to learn more about the Chaim Herzog Museum of the Jewish Soldier in World War II and to stay updated on its progress. Tzvi, thank you for joining me and talking about the much-anticipated museum to honor the Jewish men and women who helped to defeat the Nazis. It's been a real pleasure, and we look forward uh, to visiting as soon as we can. Thank you very much, Dan, and you're all more than welcome. Well, thanks again to Brigadier General Tzvi Kantor for speaking with us today about the upcoming Chaim Herzog Museum of the Jewish Soldier in World War II. And of course, to all of our viewers, thank you for tuning in. Now, if you enjoyed this conversation, make sure you never miss a program by subscribing to the B'nai B'rith YouTube channel, liking us on Facebook, and following us on Twitter and on Instagram. And be sure to visit our website, B'nai to learn more about our important work. For my guest, Tzvi Kantor, and for B'nai B'rith, I'm Dan Mariashin. See you again soon.